This week, we interview Eric Hansen from Hammer and Sickle. Santana Diaz joins us from DeCrossier Cigars. Debonair Ideal this week will talk books. That's right, the ones you actually read. And this week, Stogies of the Week will focus on and use extensively the Fight Chuck Norris Farm rating. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, it's the Stogie Geek Show. A new blend borrows from the past in the saga blend number seven. It is the perfect combination of timeless knowledge of traditional tobaccos and the newer balance that today's cigar enthusiasts come to expect and love in a fine cigar. Leveraging six generations of experience and tradition of the Reyes family, the Saga Blend Number no. 7 delivers a unique, full-flavored, medium-bodied cigar. The cigar is highlighted by a Brazilian wrapper over a blend of Central American and Dominican tobacco. Available in three sizes at an affordable price, the Saga Blend Number no. 7 is sure to please and bring together past and present. M. Bombay Cigars represent the most admired cigar culture of Cuba. They select the best of the best quality tobacco to use in the aging process. M. Bombay Cigars are then rolled in Costa Rica by some of the most experienced cigar rollers, giving it a unique smoking experience. The band portrays the detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try the M. Bombay Casera, M. Bombay Mora, and the recently released M. Bombay Habano. M. Bombay Cigars, where the cigar is a way of life. From the makers of the number one cigar in the U.S. in 2013, the Aging Room Quattro F55 comes yet another highly rated cigar, the Aging Room Bin Number 1. The Aging Room Bin Number 1 is a full-body Dominican cigar with some of the world's oldest tobacco on the market today. From the harvest of 1997, 98, and 99, the Aging Room Bin Number 1 starts out smooth and builds up in strength and flavor until it reaches its full potential. The Aging Room Bin Number 1 is for the true cigar connoisseur looking for a sophisticated smoking experience with balance, complexity, and character. Aging Room Cigars. Blending is in our DNA. Welcome, everyone, to the Stogie Geek Show. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined on the lines via Skype by Mr. Will Cooper. Welcome, Will. Greetings, everybody. It's been a fabulous week of smoking, Will. Um... Unfortunately, I won't talk about many of the cigars I smoked this week. I'm going to talk about the cigars I smoked last. I got—I don't know how I got ahead of my review schedule, Will, but I got ahead of my review schedule, and it's a great place to be. It affords yeah. me a lot of freedom and uh, you know freedom to kind of choose uh, different cigars that I'm smoking. But I'm super excited to talk. I mean, I'm going to talk about some Cubanacon and some Padron cigars that are um, you know somewhat special. Uh, actually, not somewhat special. They are very special and limited and very very good. So. Uh, we'll have a lot of fun when it comes to that segment. We're going to talk about books. Uh, we've never talked about books here on the show. Our book recommendations, Will, are probably going to vary, very greatly. I'm not a huge uh, kind of book reading uh, person, but I do have some of my favorites. And uh, we'll embody the geek portion in my, my book uh, segment, uh, That I'll, my contributions to that segment, Will. That would be that would be really good. Yeah. So why don't we introduce our, our first guest? We've got two. Of course, we're going to start the show with two two fabulous interviews. So Will, why don't you uh, do the honors? Well, yeah. I'm actually. I tell you what. I'm actually smoking um, a new cigar from uh, this guest. It's the uh, Hamon Sickle Trademark Maduro, which I'm immensely enjoying right now. We have Mr. Eric Hansen of Hammer and Sickle. Eric, Will Cooper in North Carolina, Paul Sedarian in Rhode Island. How you doing tonight? Guys, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Eric, d- tell us how you got involved in the cigar industry. Uh, we launched Hammer, uh, the, the the vodka side of our firm, in 2007. And the plan with Hammer was always to create a lifestyle opportunity. So we, how we, we right from the start, we knew we would mature into tobacco when the time was right. And we found the time to be right in late 2008. So we started doing some homework, learning, doing our research, and... 
you know, about took us you know a little over twelve months, and we went to market. Um, we started to ship January of two thousand and ten. So, did you uh, start the company with other people, or kind of on your own, or like how did it start in the in the beginning? No, Eric, you there? You know, it was a group of yeah. We're, you're kind of cutting in and out. Sorry. Uh, um, no, there was a there was a group of us that had um, had an opportunity. You know, I have a I have a beer background and have some friends that obviously were in the industry, and our family's been in the in the wine, spirits, and beer business um, since the late 1800s. So we were in the beer business at the time and decided to sell that off, move that company over, and went ahead and started Hammer with uh, with some other folks. And you know, <laughs> knock on wood, here we are today. Things are going great. That's awesome. So, did you exclusively start with vodka in the beginning? Yeah, vodka was our what we found to be the opportunity for us. Um, sort of the the stars all aligned, and we had access to some capacity, and we had a great brand concept, and we had a really a, a we call them formulas in that side of the business. We had a formula we really wanted to go to market with, mm-hmm. and so we had to find the right raw materials, and we sort of searched through what's called the Black Earth region of of. Russia to find the perfect winter wheat and our distillery is in a town called Klin 80 kilometers north of Moscow so we dry ship to Klin and do our little uh our, our little magic dance as we nicknamed it in the office so we go through our six times distilled six times filtered proprietary process we rest our product for 72 hours and then we take it to market so when you say uh is most vodka uh is that derived from wheat you know, you can make vodka theoretically from just about anything, but they're really sort of the, the vodka purists around the world really only consider two things to be the true base for vodka, and that would be wheat. Let's say 90% of the business is wheat, and then you have sort of a small offshoot of it that is that is potato. Mm. Uh, the, the, the poles, as an example, tr- traditionally work with potatoes. And then you have all sorts of offshoots that have happened over the last – They've really sort of become in vogue over the last 10 to 15 years, and that's where you have all kinds of things. I mean, you have maple syrup. You have um, literally uh, you know, hundreds of different people. You know, Tito's is an example, a very well-known brand. That's corn. Mm-hmm. So there, you, you can do it a number of different ways. But the, the true purists, the folks that have been doing it for literally hundreds of years, have traditionally used either um, champagne wheat, winter wheat, or potatoes. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. And is it the same? The is it similar to the process? Um, is it similar to uh, Scotch and rye whiskey? Do you start out making a mash like you would make beer, and then ultimately end up with vodka? You do. That's correct. You have to go through a fermentation process. Mm-hmm. So, as an example, we'll go through harvest. We bring that. You know, obviously, you clear the harvest. You dry ship to the distillery. And then we go ahead and create the mash, and that's it's that it's that mash. Right. Where you're developing the actual beverage, the actual beverage, beverage alcohol component. Um, that's really so. M- most people, uh, Eric, to be honest with you, uh, it's kind of interesting sure. how it draws parallels to cigars and other types of spirits. People get these preconceived notions about all of these things. And when I talk to people about cigars, you know the one of the big sure. ones running around now is well cuban cigars are the best right and you know we all have to kind of you know deal with that and educate people when people think of vodka sure. they think of you know your your average everyday mixed drinks that people are making with vodka um, that you could mix it really with anything and you really won't taste the vodka you're tasting whatever they mix it with and that's i find a lot of people's perception about vodka but uh, as with most things it's way more involved with that can you kind of uh, elaborate on that Sure, your base distillate. So whatever you whatever you're using. Um, so as an example, you use, we use winter wheat, and our winter wheat through the through our process, you get a very clean, very round mouth feel, a very clean finish, and with an almost a, a soft, subtle sweetness. And that's what distilling from winter wheat will provide. Mm-hmm. Corn is going to give you a different feel and a different. Um, a, definitely a different mouth feel, and you're going to get, depending on the amount of distillation and filtration, you're going to get different flavors. The ones that really get strange are when you get out into starches and really raw sugars like maple syrup, and when you get into potatoes, it's just a much, it's an entirely different product. It, it, it tastes different in your mouth from a flavor perspective. It leaves a different film in your mouth from a mouth feel perspective. It's not clean. So, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, you can, the idea 
the definition of vodka is an odorless, flavorless liquid. Hmm. Nothing is further from the truth. I mean, the reality is you're using biologics to create a product, and there's going to be um, there are going to be differences in how people do it through process and what they use to create the process based around. We happen to use winter wheat. Again, others use other things. Why do they call it winter wheat? There are two wheat. You can get two wheat crops to the year, um, and one is called champagne wheat. And think of and I'll tell you the difference. The difference is. And you can have to kind of get into your uh, the right side of your brain here and get a little creative. Think of champagne wheat or summer wheat, as it's nicknamed, um, is more cake-like. So it sort of is crumbly and falls apart in your mouth and, and sort of kind of wastes away and is very, very soft. Winter wheat, which is planted uh, late in the fall, germinates, uh, buds a little bit. Then obviously in Russia, the snows and the cold weather come and... That all gets buried, and then in the spring, um, when everything melts and the it warms up, you the plant finishes its growth cycle, hmm. and you get a harvest in March. That wheat is a I would call it a heartier wheat. So you think more of a great bread. So you go to an Italian restaurant, and there's that great crusty loaf in front of you, and you just want to tear into it. That's that mouthfeel you get from winter wheat in comparison to a champagne wheat, where it sort of falls apart in your mouth. Oh, that's that's awesome. Um, so, what were some of the? So, where did you begin when it came to cigars underneath? Uh, you know, the Hammer and Sickle brands. You'd already sounds like you already established yourself uh, in the spirits market, specifically vodka. Uh, how did you uh, start the process for cigars? Uh, you know, it, it, again, everything is right place, right time. You know, we bumped into some folks that we thought could help us out. We had some great conversations, and we started to tour factories mm -hmm. with these people and started to do our homework and understand what was out there. And, you know, and, and we have a tendency to overanalyze everything, so the process took us quite a period of time. I think a lot of people jump into this business with two feet. The first person they meet, we didn't do that uh, from a factory perspective. So it took us a while to get comfortable. We certainly got comfortable with our partners, and I think right now we're making – you know, obviously there's some bias, but I think we're making some of the best cigars in the market today. Excellent. So did you, um, what are some of the brands underneath uh, Hammer and Sickle? Because I smoked a number of different Hammer and Sickle cigars. In fact, tonight sure. I, I lit up the uh, Hermitage. Hermitage is a very interesting uh, interesting cigar. You know, we, it's, it's great that you brought it up because it's, it, it fits the name of your show because we call it our geek cigar. Um, the Hermitage is, I think for us, was a real leap of faith. We had to stretch ourselves to do this. We're such a, you know, we're, we're a cautious brand. We try to be exceedingly elegant. Uh, and as you look through our line, you get a lot of that. We stick, you know, we're, 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 again, we're very, very good at Connecticut shade. We're good at some things that, um, a aesthetics and quality and, and whatnot. This was our first leap into, you know, again, it's Ecuadorian grown Habano wrapper. It's got several tobaccos. One of the tobaccos, believe it or not, in there is from Mannheim, Germany. We're one of the only companies in the world using it. Hmm. Um, so this was our chance to truly geek out and do something way off the map. Um, it certainly blew us out of our comfort zone. And it was such a great process and such a time for us to learn that we're so much – we're more capable, I think, than we realize now. You know, We're five years into the business. We understand the landscape. We sort of more understand the consumer than we did – and we can challenge ourselves to bring more more unique offerings to market, less safe, if you will, and push the envelope a little bit. Um, so what's the uh, wrapper, binder, and filler for this Hermitage? Uh, Hermitage. Hermitage. Actually, Hermitage sorry. is an <laughs> interesting story on the name. Her no problem. We named it after um, the largest museum in Russia, which is in St. Petersburg. Beautiful, beautiful building. If you go to our new website uh, um, that we launched uh, three days ago, believe it or not, you can uh, you can walk through. It's almost like a, t a tour through all the cities that we name our cigars after. If, you know, as you go to each page and you you flip through all the different brands. So, hscigars.com for anybody that's listening that wants to go check that out. And on each of those pages, it'll walk you through um, all the wrappers, fillers, and binders. This was our first time. You know, again, this is. This was interesting for us. We had worked with 
with Habana Seed before. So this was our, our really our first um, foray in pushing ourselves sort of down that more traditional line of flavor and then trying to do some things. So again, adding the, the German tobacco was um, definitely pushed it up a notch. It's got some Dominicans in there and some Hondurans in there. So it's really, a, it's, a, it's an interesting mix. It's definitely a geekier cigar than as an example would be the one you were saying before, you were just smoking trademark uh, Maduro. Trademark Maduro is great. It's San Andreas wrapper over Dominican filler, Dominican binder. Mild, exceedingly sweet, beautiful, um, beautiful Maduro for you know early in the day or the entry level Maduro smoker. Mm. Eric, I gotta I gotta jump in on this. This, this San Andreas wrapper, and I've been a kind of a critic of it. Sure. I have never had a milder cigar. When, um, and this is a compliment. Usually, sure. the San Andreas wrapper I find is is kind of rough. You've gotten this thing to work on a milder cigar that I'm just blown away by this right now. I don't think I've seen anything like this on the market. We don't think it exists. We we, we found the space to be yeah exciting for us. Again, there are a lot of folks out there smoking Connecticut, right? They're, they like mild. They're on the golf course. It's going to be early in the day or something. And that's sort of where that Connecticut smoker lives, right? Well, it doesn't mean they're going to be – they're not going to enjoy the sweetness of Maduro that's done properly and traditionally. And I'm not talking about dyes and oils. I'm not talking about propylene glycol that some people are faking it with. I'm talking this is the real thing. You can rub that cigar with white gloves and nothing's coming off because that is true traditional Maduro. And the benefit of true traditional Maduro done properly is you get this beautiful sweet flavor, but you don't have to have all this extra strength that people bulk up the filler and the, and the binder with. You don't have to play that game. Maduro does not have to be a club to the side of the head. It can be beautiful and elegant and it can be done properly if you leave the filler and binder mild and just let the sweetness win what I call win the day. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it really, it really does. And it, and it kind of showed me that, yeah, the San Andreas wrapper can work with something like this. It's very, I never thought it could. So you're saying, so which one you know, is the, uh, I'm sorry, Eric, which one is the San Andreas wrapper? We use San Andreas wrapper on the Maduro, trademark okay. series Maduro. Okay. Awesome. So we have a Connecticut version of that cigar, which mm -hmm. you know is a cigar for us that sort of really took us to the next level. And then we wanted to add something to that line. So we said, Let, let's see if we can bring a true mild Maduro to market. So we left the filler in the binder exact same as the Connecticut version. We literally just put a San Andreas wrapper on it. Beautiful San Andreas wrapper, by the way. And... We, again, we're just we're thrilled because you get the elegance and sweetness that Maduro can deliver if it's not forced to be overpowered by what's inside of it. I, I agree. Now, the the trademark series in the Connecticut that was your old Icon series that's been rebranded, correct? That is correct. So when you create, and I always and I kind of followed your line, and it was real interesting because you had a Connecticut, you had an Ecuadorian Connecticut offering. Already, and it was your tradition, correct? Yeah, tradition is interesting. It's you know, it, it's the cigar we launched the brand with. It's a global favorite. It's still our number one seller. It's you know, it it, it truly is an amazing, elegant cigar. What we found with that cigar is as as mild as we found it to be. We we always drew it on the line of right on the line of mild to medium body. A lot of people said, well, could you you know, why don't you consider adding something? truly mild um, in a Connecticut form. We said, all right, well, let's work on it. And what we found is Connecticut, Connecticut, which is what's on trademark Connecticut, um, really does deliver exceptional flavor in a mild format. So, you know, we, once we got it right from a binder and filler perspective, we were, we were comfortable taking that to market. And I love about that, that you have the, you have the Connecticut, U.S. Connecticut on the trademark, and then on your tradition, you have the Ecuadorian Connecticut. So you kind of have a different. You have two Connecticut's, but they're they're two different tobacco leaves wrapping it, which which is something I like kind of as the Stogie Geek in me again. They're wildly different. I mean, an American Connecticut, although they're both shade grown, you know, the Ecuadorian Connecticut, you get that. You know, not only is it shade grown, but I call it cloud grown as well. You know, the the fields are at the bottom of these beautiful mountains, and they trap the clouds. So you get really 40 to 50 percent cloud cover on average per day. So again, sorry to geek out on you, but I love this stuff. Um, no, please do. Please do, yeah. <laughs> you, you, uh, 
you, you have to understand the differentiation that delivers. So what you get in a in a U.S. Connecticut where you don't get the real cloud cover, you get sort of the protected shades. So you get a little bit of a thicker wrapper. And when you do that, obviously you're getting more sugars in the wrapper and you're getting a little a little more flavor and a little more interest than you get out of an Ecuadorian Connecticut. An Ecuadorian Connecticut gives you a wrapper that is silky to the touch, amazingly thin, exceedingly elegant, and with age delivers a very unique flavor unto itself, but it gets a little more earthy. Um, so they really do. They give you two, while they're both quote-unquote Connecticut shade, being grown in two different parts of the world and being grown with different different actual exposure to sun because one's got 50% more cover than the other on an average basis is really inter- it's really an interesting way to look at the differentiation in Connecticut. Connecticut doesn't get Connecticut shade tobacco doesn't get enough respect in what I you know I guess what we could call the geek spectrum. I mean there's a lot there's there's some things And everybody wants to talk about. Oh. Uh, it sounds like Eric's having some latency issues there. Eric, you're still Habano there. Habano, and everybody wants to talk about different flavors. Hello. Yeah, I got you. Sorry, you were breaking up there for a minute. Could you just restart uh, past like 30 seconds or so? Sure. What were you talking about? <laughs> I couldn't the tell because it, yeah, it was it was breaking up in my headset. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was talking. I think I was talking about the fact that I don't. I don't believe Connecticut shade tobacco gets the respect it deserves from the sort of the aficionado or you know I don't care if you want to call it the geek community or the real the person that's exceedingly into cigars and really researches it. I think everybody's got their you know their panties in a bunch over Nicaragua and Honduras and you know then you get into the Brazilian and the Peruvian and. Nobody's really talking about the difference and the unique flavors that can be derived from different production methods, blending methods, uh, fermentation methods with Connecticut. And Connecticut is different where you grow it and how you grow it and the cover that it gets. And it gives different flavors and and different levels of elegance. I I really wish it would get a little more attention than it gets. You're actually actually hitting Mm -hmm. a sweet spot with Paul here. Absolutely. Uh, Because Paul is probably... He is the ultimate uh, Connecticut geek here when it comes to this. He is a huge smoker. I'll let, I, I won't get it done, Paul. I, but, you know, I, as I've said on the show before, I really love to smoke uh, in the morning. It's one of my favorite times to smoke. I most often reach for milder cigars. In my kind of search for milder cigars that have flavor, I um, wasn't afraid to try all of the Ecuadorian Connecticut's. And I've tried quite a few uh, I branch out sometimes into Cameroon, uh, but okay. for the most part, I'll come back to the Connecticut shade wrappers, and I've certainly, um, you know, kind of shed all my preconceived notions, and I'm like, I'm just going to smoke it. You know, I don't care what people say about Connecticut's and the bad rap that, so you know, the so-called bad rap that Connecticut's have gotten. I'm like, I'm throwing caution to the wind, and I'm just, I'm going to smoke them all in the morning with my coffee after I eat breakfast, and... <clears throat> It runs the gamut, right? I've had some that I really, really like, and they're my staples. I've had, you know, some that are kind of just, you know, they're okay. They're good cigars. Um, sure. And then I've had some that I'm like, oh, not, you know, that's why Connecticut gets a bad rap, right? And it's sometimes it's hard for me to find those ones that really shine uh, and are like those box ones that I keep a box of. Those Connecticut's are ones that I really sure. like. and. I've smoked a lot of different Connecticut's, and, and the ones I keep a box of are really what you're saying, Eric, and back up what you're saying, that Connecticut shade done right can really, really, really be a good cigar. It can be extraordinary. Yeah, sorry, there's no question. Absolutely there. extraordinary. This is my, my spiel on, on Connecticut's, but... Um, I'm with you. I'm backing you up. Yes, I'd high-five you. you if I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm really enjoying uh, Eric this uh, Hermitage. Did I say it correctly? Finally, yes, you did. Okay. It. You nailed it. Good, good. It's really good. It's yeah, a- and I'll I'll just kind of throw it. At, yeah, I've smoked that. It's a fantastic cigar. I think you spoke box, very favorably of this cigar in the past, Will. Yeah. Yes. It, and then, like Eric said, it appealed to the geek in me with that cigar. Absolutely. Yep. 
Um, so what are some of the other lines, Eric, that you have uh, at Hammer and Sickle that we haven't mentioned yet? Well, there's so much going on and so many transitions in that cigar. Oh, absolutely. You know, we have uh, a trademark we talked about. We have um, tradition series, which we talked about, Hermitage, you're smoking. Berlin Wall is our dead center medium body. Uh, gorgeous Honduran cigar. Six-year age wrapper, four-year age filler and binder. Um, comes in a marble box. It's got a pressed copper band that's held on by tensile strength, not um, not glue. So that's really, you know, if you want an experience cigar, you want to give somebody a gift, they're going to look at you and say, oh, my God, I can't imagine what you spent on this. Um, Berlin Wall certainly delivers that for you. And then on our, from a full-bodied perspective, we worked with Connecticut Broadleaf, uh, and created what uh, the br brand we call Moscow City. Um, Connecticut Broadleaf is unfortunately, uh, because it's so hard to work with and becoming so exceedingly expensive, sort of a dying breed in our industry, which is just a shame because that is, I mean, that is such a such a great leaf, such great history. Um, and when done properly, again, we do it in true Maduro, so you get some sweetness out of it, not just the body of the Broadleaf. It just, it's just a fascinating cigar. Um, such an interesting sort of, you know, I, I wouldn't suggest it first thing in the morning unless you're a true, uh, <laughs> a true, a true go getter. Um, yeah, you don't want to do that to yourself. It's definitely got some, uh, it's definitely got some strength to it. But again, that Connecticut broadleaf and that that particular flavor that broadleaf, Connecticut grown Connecticut broadleaf, delivers is just uh, it's second to none. Nice. Um, so, is the, Eric, is, I wanted to ask you, is there a pairing between the vodka that you would drink, you know, kind of like neat um, vodka, uh, that you would pair with your cigars? Like, do you do anything that, or have any recommendations for people that want to pair your cigars with your vodka? Did you go down that path, or are they mutually exclusive? No, you know what's interesting? Uh, everybody talks about pairing and in the modern day, everybody says, Oh my God, I can't believe that you're a vodka company in the tobacco business because I mean, come on, it's, it's all about scotch, man. What's where, where's the whiskey, bud? I mean, don't you understand that they pair and they're perfect. Did everybody miss the eighties? You know, did everybody miss the true, the first cigar boom in the eighties where it was martinis and cigars that built the whole thing? Right. <laughs> the idea between. You know, clear spirits with a cigar does something very different than a quote unquote pair, a modern day pairing. Everyone decides now that has decided, these aficionados, if you will, have decided that to have a pairing, the two things have to taste alike and have to act alike. And therefore, in some way, they complement each other in the mouth. Well, imagine if you were out to dinner and the chef came out and said, I've got potatoes that taste like steak. I gave you steak that tastes like steak and broccoli that tastes like steak. Well, that's pretty, and I, I can't swear, so I won't, but I'd give you the F-bomb, and that's pretty boring. So the way we look at clear spirits with cigars is they actually do something very unique. They cleanse your palate while you're smoking. And then you take your next puff, and, oh, lo and behold you taste something new and wonderful in the cigar. So, again, the vodka doesn't quote-unquote pair with the cigar in the modern sense of pairing, but martinis and cigars have gone together forever. Cleansing the palate with cigars has gone together forever. And, you know, you don't have to just get stuck in this tranche of whiskey and, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry of scotch, and then, you know, this tranche of all of a sudden bourbons, you know, neat and cool. And hey, listen, I'm a huge scotch and bourbon lover as well. But it's not like it's the only thing you have to have with it. I mean, feel free to have a beer with your cigar. It's going to be okay. Have a vodka with your cigar. It's going to be okay. Have a rum with your cigar. It's going to be okay. You're going to survive. Mm. Yeah, I think the same thing that I feel like, Eric, with uh, Connecticut, uh, I feel the same way with spirits and pairings is that people kind of need to open up, you know, their minds. And it's interesting. What doesn't work for me in a pairing might work for someone else. 
And I, I think, you know, up until recently, I used to kind of poo-poo that. I think I've become a lot more open-minded that, hey, if you're having a cigar and you're drinking an IPA-style beer and it works for you, then by all means, go for it. Like, you, I think with pairings, you got to do what works for you, and you can't be closed-minded. And, you know, there's a lot of things that have changed my perception about that over time. Um, you know, some of it's from manufacturers that actually send us cigars and tell us to pair it with this particular spirit. And I'm, like, really skeptical sure. to begin with. And then I try it, and I'm like, wow, that was that was actually good. Like, maybe I shouldn't be... Uh, you know, such a stickler about what I pair things with. So I, I totally hear what you're saying. There's no, I mean, you don't have to, isn't your life about living it the way you want to live it? You know, don't you get to a point in life where, I mean, listen, cigars are nothing, aren't a have to have. They're a nice to have. They're a want to have. Have it your own way. Everybody does not have to do what they're told. Just because, you know, some magazine or some this or some that said this was good doesn't make it good. What makes to good is that you like it, you enjoy it, and you're living your life that way. No, I I totally agree. Um, I I think sometimes people that extend to you know how you cut your cigar, how you light your cigar. I do think there's general guidelines you should abide by when you do that kind of thing. However, I have my, my opinions have matured to pairings that you know experiment how you want and and do do what feels good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely, I'm so with you. I like that. That should be a tagline. Do what feels good. That's it. <laughs> so, uh, Eric, tell us about some of the limited editions uh, that you guys have done. Uh, we did a great one for the Sochi Olympics called Sochi. <laughs> oh, got, you know, my brand. goodness. Is that a great cigar? Will, you rated that cigar very high. <laughs> very. It was one of my top ten cigars last year. Yeah, so we did, uh, we did Sochi, and that was our first foray into – Using an extraordinary volume of tobaccos in a cigar that had nine different tobaccos in the cigar, um, which, by the way, gets challenging to do in a 48 ring gauge. Uh, then we have done LE14, which was a – we liked the shape. We liked the Dahlia's size, so we stayed with that for our, our LE14. Uh, we changed up the tobaccos to use seven countries and found a very interesting blend that we liked. Again, we allow ourselves to kind of geek geek out on the uh, on the limited stuff which is an awful lot of fun and then we've had uh what else have we done we've done we all well, we do a uh, special brand uh again it's a connecticut broadleaf a uh, full-bodied cigar for texas called tver t-v-e-r named after a very hip city in Ma uh in russia so we you know we, we don't get too far down the line in uh in limited edition work we like to kind of sell our core and focus on a brand that the consumer can have all the time. But to get unique and then push ourselves and push the limits, we do them every now and then. Is it true with the Sochi you sent one to Russia? We did. We sent a box to Putin. Did he? Do you know if he ever smoked it? I don't know if he smoked it. I know he got it. Oh, wow. That's awesome. And that's truly a one and done. We're not, we're not going to see that come back. Yeah, one of the nine tobaccos is never going to be grown again. So it's uh, yeah, it's it was it it's very interesting. Um, I'd like to bring that cigar back. We physically can't. So my my guess is that um, Putin smoked it while he was like horseback riding with a bow and was like hunting game with a cigar like hanging out of his mouth. That's kind of how I envision it. He's that kind of guy. That's pretty cool. That's a pretty good vision. <laughs> I think it's pretty accurate too, from everything you see about him. Mostly, he's, you know, stuff on the internet. He's, but he's a tough guy. He's a tough guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Will, do you have more questions for Eric? Well, as so we were talking about Scotch before, and and now you've launched a a whole new brand. Um, I'm, I'm Kalinok, correct? I said it right. Yeah. So later this month, we're going to actually take the first 250 boxes to market. Um, this is this is a cool project. We um, yeah, I'm gonna talk out of both sides of my mouth. The, the Kalanok is sort of a. I never found a from a pairing perspective, and I've challenged so many people to this. That I've never found a cigar that I thought delivered a very specific flavor that peated Scotch deliver, which is that salty earthiness um, that you get from Isla whiskeys. And I love that flavor, and I think that flavor is fascinating. 
but, but I'd love to be able to have that. And I think cigar is such a great format to deliver it in. I want a cigar that can deliver that, that flavor profile. So we went ahead and uh, started working on this three years ago and, and did some research and did a little bit of traveling and started to understand the process of scotch making and, and how they actually get uh, the phenols to be imparted into the, into the wheat before they go through the malting process. And so we, we learned it, we went through it, we understood it. We hooked up with a very cool producer, which we'll announce later this month, um, a cool factory in the DR that was willing to kind of take this, this journey with us um, and create a, a process where you can do this. This is not, uh, again, you're not, people have cured tobacco with heat before, obviously in fire curing, and they've done it with, with different things. This is curing tobacco actually um, going through that process of, of finishing tobacco with smoke. I mean, it's sort of, you know, this is an entirely different concept that had to be worked through. You have to deal with humidities and then things that fall apart. And, um, you know, and we ruined quite a bit of tobacco doing this, but knock on wood, we're here and we're, we're bringing our first one out, which is uh, what we call Calinoc 25. So 25% of the filler will be what we call peak, uh, peat fired tobacco. And then in about four months, we're going to drop the 50 on the market. And, and then at the trade show, we'll have the 75. So uh, Kalanok will, will become in, in different sort of flavor strengths, not strength of the cigar, but flavor, peat flavor strengths. So in other words, you took the process that they use for, for the barley, basically, in scotch. And now you've kind of taken what they do with that and you've applied that to tobacco. That's correct. So no, yeah, I don't, took, I, don't, uh, I don't, I don't, you guys are the, I don't have never heard of that being done. So you guys are definitely the first from what I hear on that. Yeah. You know, and, and everybody that we talked to said, well, why are you going through this kind of process? Why are you dealing with, with doing it this way? Why don't you just create an emulsion and, you know, see if you can deliver the flavor through um, either bait tuning or actually infusing the cigar. I said, well, cause you're missing the point. The point, point is to get the phenols from the smoke to actually impart into, th into the tobacco through the curing process so that, that flavor, no matter what you do with the tobacco going forward, that flavor is imparted the way it is pre-distillation, as an example, in whiskey making process. So getting it into the actual genetics, um, the biology of the barley, we want to get it into the genetics, the biology of, um, of the tobacco leaf so that we want a process that is true and artful and honest and actually does the same thing so that it tastes the same way. You know, just because you fake it doesn't mean you made it. it you got to actually be able to do this thing in a very unique way that actually has a story to it, that has some honesty to, to it. You know, anybody can sit in a lab and try to cook something up, but at the end of the day, to actually achieve this through work and persistence and dedication and uh, biologic understanding and chemistry and, and working with great producers, it's, you know, again, Cigars are an art form. You know, the, the more as an industry we get into faking it with, you know, like we're faking Maduro, some people are with glycol and all sorts of other stuff. The more we fake it, the more we open ourselves up to regulation and issues and concerns. And you, you don't want to go down that road. We want to do this honestly and with some integrity. No, absolutely. And by the way, uh, Eric Wentworth gave me a sample of that cigar. And it, it's, I'll say it's very, it's got a lot of complexity to it. Um, it was the 25, but I didn't feel like I got the peat flavor. But it didn't. There was so much else I was getting off that cigar too. Um, so I, I really think that this is something. I, I've been kind of indifferent on some of the fire cures that come out, but the traditional fire cures. Mm -hmm. But this was, I would say, very different. Yeah. Again, it's it's not. not you're not going to get not roasting wood, and you're trying to pick up those wood flavors again, which is that barbecue potato chip, which I think is great. I think the guys over, as an example, at um. Oh, I was, Drawing a blank on their name, um, Drew Estate. I mean, I think that cigar is the fire from a fire cure perspective. I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's a beautiful cigar. Those guys did a brilliant job bringing that particular flavor to market, and they should be, you know, applauded for it. Uh, we were we weren't looking to do that. This isn't a fire cured cigar. This is a peat fired cigar. This is something totally different. And when you you said you were going through a lot of the tobaccos, and you obviously you, you said you went ruined some. It was the Corojo leaf that you settled on, which was the one that seemed most conducive to this process. 
at this point. The other ones are conducive. We just, you know, again, coming down the home stretch, we wanted to take something to market. To be quite honest with you, you know, pre-FDA, we want to make sure this thing, um, you know, there's this looming possible ruling that's going to come down, and we wanted to make sure we got at least something into the marketplace. We think we can do this with a lot of different tobaccos. I think there are, are probably hundreds of ways you can do this. It's going to take some learning. You know, you've got to have some R&D budget because you're going to burn some tobacco, literally. Um, and you, you got to be able, you know, you got to be willing to do that, that stuff. I, you know, R&D isn't done enough, I don't think, in this business. I think if we did more of that, if the industry did more of that, would be growing the consumer base instead of just allowing it to erode and decline. And as far as the 25 goes, was that kind of a deliberate strategy? Okay, let's let's put the 25 out there and then kind of grow those next more bolder peat cigars, if you may. Yeah, as we watched some of the other people, as we you know, we, we took a good long look at how Fire Cured was received in the marketplace. A lot of people thought it was the flavor was very very aggressive because there was almost too much of it in there early. You know, the people that took to the flavor took to the flavor and they love it and that's their cigar and that's what they do and that's great. But what we wanted to do is have the mild one come out first. Oh, hey, this is interesting, but boy, I'd like to try one that maybe has a little more of the flavor or, okay, this is enough for me. I'm going to stick with this. So that's why we wanted a deliberate strategy of starting with the mildest one we were going to come out with first and then we'll build on that um, developing trial and developing obviously a brand name. But... We, we didn't want to come out with a 75 first and everyone said, oh, my God, it was too much. I'm not going to try anything else. It's hard to work backward instead of working consumer up yeah. the chain. You, know, yeah. you certainly don't have – the first your first cigar shouldn't be something over the top that's going to make you – you know, your stomach turn and, and whatnot. You, maybe an entry, Connecticut or something, get people into smoking. Let's not uh, offend everybody off the bat. Absolutely. <clears throat> Eric – uh, are you ready to play five questions with the Stoic Geeks? I'm in. Three words to describe yourself. Is overweight two or one? Um, whatever you want it to be. You pick. <laughs> uh, uh, passionate, good father, um, cigar lover. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, that's a great question. What a great question. I'm not sure. That, that, I, you got to think about that one. That's a good one. Um, I don't know. Something ex- like exotic from the, the Middle Ages. You know, like that, that ball with the spikes and then the, the nice. handle. Yes. And thing, yeah. like, something yeah. like that. You gotta I get creative with it. You can't. It can't just be a knife or something or a gun. That's just that's no fun. You got to really. Like, if, you, if you're gonna throw your life away and be a heinous individual, you might as well do it with some, some creativity. Eric, I've heard everything. The answers to that question have ranged from mashed potatoes to poison. So just you know, mashed potatoes. That's brilliant. I like yeah. that one too. <laughs> Eric, if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Uh, it'd be a pamphlet because I certainly wouldn't write about myself. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Wow. Another interesting question. The game of Ask Grabby Grabby. Well, at 42 and being married for, for, uh, for quite a long time, I'm not, I haven't played Ask Grabby Grabby in a long time, but I'd go second. Huh. He, he's one of the few people who heard of the game. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He's like, oh, yeah, I know that game. Uh, Eric, choose two celebrities to be your parents. Um, I have them. I have celebrity parents, so I'm in. I'm all That's done. awesome. That's awesome. Eric, thank you so much for appearing on the, the Stoic Geek Show. Uh, I, very, I really liked your Hermitage cigar. That was very good. This is the first time that I have smoked this cigar, or at least I haven't reviewed it before. Uh, I kind of went, went back through my notes. So uh, I, I have a couple more. I'll probably smoke another one and, and write up a review on it because I think it's really good. All right, great. Well, guys, hey, listen, I can't thank you enough for having us on. And, uh, um, you know, hey, maybe, maybe we'll come back on when Kalanok hits the market and we'll go from there. Sounds we great. We look forward to it. Absolutely. Thanks, Eric. All right. Thank you, guys, Eric. Guys, have, amaz- have an amazing night. Smoke well. Thank you. Appreciate you it. too. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come back with our next feature interview for the show. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. 